Okay, so you're ready to glaze. And before you do that, there's a couple things you should do maybe the day before you plan to glaze. The first thing that you should do is wash these off just with a quick rinse under the sink. This will get any dust and debris that might be on them off. And you should also wax the bottoms of your pieces. The wax is a resist and it prevents glaze from sticking in the areas that we don't want it. Okay. Um, when we glaze our pieces, we cannot have any glaze down here on the bottoms. If there's anything left over, it needs to get sponged off. So you want to make sure you've got yourself a, a wet sponge as well. And to apply the wax, we just use these sponge brushes because they're cheap and they're easy to clean. If you don't clean these up, the wax will kind of ruin the brush over time. So when you're applying your wax, um, I, I just wash these off. So they're a little bit wet still. There's moisture that stays inside the clay. And if I have a piece with an undercut, I'm going to wax the entire bottom of the piece. And I'm also going to wax up to this line in my undercut, just right there. So that line acts as a good place to end your glazing, but it also acts as um, kind of a, a dam to prevent the glaze from running over that corner. Now if you overglaze your work quite a bit, it will run and will stick to the shelf, but by waxing your undercut, we're just adding a little extra layer of protection in case uh, you do overglaze a bit. This is something that should be done slowly and carefully. Don't just run your brush over it quickly and, and make it sloppy. We want this edge to be nice and crisp. Now, the less wax you use, the better. Um, once the wax is on there, it will do its job. If I add more wax, it's not going to do a better job of preventing the glaze. If I can get it on there as thin as possible, it should dry pretty quickly. If I have a piece where I do not have an undercut, you can see this first one I did, the second one I don't. If I, for some reason, didn't get my undercut in there, you need to wax back about an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch to prevent any running glaze from getting down to the kiln shelf. So what I do is I take a pencil and I just set that pencil flat on the ground like this and I bring my piece right up next to the pencil and I rotate that piece and draw a line along the bottom. And that's gonna be my wax line. I'm gonna stop my waxing right at that line. And it's nice and straight and precise and it's better than hand drawing. So again, try to get your wax on as thin as you can. In my opinion, the thinner the better. A couple things about the wax that are very important to remember. <clears throat> um, once it's on the clay, there's really no way to get it off. So the wax doesn't sponge off or um, rub off or anything like that. Once it's in your clay, it's sort of absorbed into the pores of the clay. And the only way to get it out is to run it back through a firing. Now, occasionally, if you've got a little tiny bit, sometimes you can sand, out, sand it out um, and it'll go away. But if you really make a mistake, like as I'm brushing this on the side of the piece, if I get a big drip that runs down the side, that, that piece then needs to be refired before you can glaze it. So if you make that mistake, you need to take the time to fix it, run it through the kiln again, and then reglaze it later or rewax it later. Um, once I've got that done, I need to make sure I take my brush over to the sink and rinse this out with hot water, hot soapy water, to get all the rest of that wax out. And I need to make sure that I cap the wax jar so that all the stuff on the inside doesn't just dry out. Once I've got my work waxed and ready to glaze, I can start figuring out what colors I want to use. If you look at the buckets, each bucket should have a test tile. And when you look at that test tile, you're going to see that there's, there's sometimes two different colors. So for example, this red on the front of the, the test tile is different than the red on the back of the test tile. 
And basically what that is, is I've applied this glaze over the white clay and a dark clay, just to see if it would look different over a darker clay body. Each bucket should have one. And every time I mix a new glaze, it gets a new test tile so that we know what's in the bucket is, is exactly what comes out on the test tile. Now sometimes over time, some of your glazes will, will change a little bit. Uh, that does happen. Um, but generally, um, it's not much of an issue in the studio. Okay. So once you've decided what glaze you want, first thing you're going to need to do, take the lid off. And you'll notice that your glaze is kind of separated. Usually the water's on top of the glaze and all the glaze materials down below the water. So you're gonna have to mix this up with the drill and make sure that it's properly mixed before you actually dip your work. So we've got drills in the classroom. It just has this paint mixer on there. You're gonna run the paint mixer right inside the bucket until it's mixed evenly and all that water is dispersed back into the glaze. Now the, the drill is gonna be dripping, so I generally we will, when I pull it out of the glaze, I spin it one more time. And that just gets all the drips off of the glaze. And then I don't set this down on the counter because that's, that's going to make a mess. I try to set it down on the cap that I pulled off of the glaze bucket. And that's usually where I put my stuff. This will make less cleanup for me. All right, I want to show you two different ways to glaze your pieces. Okay, unlike what you've probably, probably done in the past where you've taken a brush and you brush your glaze on, all of our glaze is in here dip, dipped. And you could brush this if you wanted to, but it's not really formulated for that, and it doesn't brush as, as well as, as the commercial glazes you're used to using. So if we do a dip, it needs to be roughly one to two seconds long. Any more than two seconds, and you run the risk of your glaze becoming too thick on the surface and running down the side during the, the firing. We don't want that. Okay, That usually ends up uh, in, a, in a lost piece after the, the firing. Um, I've got these glazing tongs which work, work really well. Um, if you want to glaze your entire piece the same glaze, you could, could just grab the side of your piece with the tongs, dip it right, right inside the glaze, count to two, pull it out, and let all of the extra glaze drip out of the side. And so that's what I'm going to do here with this first one. Okay. So again, I'm going to start a two-second counter as soon, as soon as I have put this into the glaze, and when I pull it out, I'm going to sponge off all of the extra stuff so here we go. In, one 1,000, two 1,000, pull it out. Let all of that extra glaze drip out of the inside. And most of it should have come off the bottom. I do always have a little bit left over, so you want to make sure you have your sponge with you, and you can just clean off the bottom of that piece really nice and easy. If you forget to put the wax on, and the whole bottom is coated in glaze, that's okay, you, you can still sponge it off, it just takes a little bit more effort to do that. Okay. Now with these tongs, once I remove the tongs, sometimes I have a little bit of a, a mark here on the, in the inside and on the outside. You could just take your finger, dip it in the glaze, and fill in that mark if you need to. Okay. And I can do that on the inside too. Although they usually heal back over without much of an issue. And that piece would be done and ready for the kiln. Now my next piece I'm going to glaze a little bit differently. I've got this nice tall cylinder and I want to put a different glaze on the inside than I put on the outside. And so what I've got here is a nice white liner glaze. It'd be good for like if you were making functional work that you wanted to use cups, bowls, plates. This white's a great surface to um, use for the functional side of a piece. So I'm going to put that on the inside in the thoughts that maybe I would use this as a cup or something along those lines. Okay, And I'll do a separate glaze on the outside. So I'm going to glaze my interior first. Uh, before I do that, I need to mix up my glaze because, again, that water is settled out. 
So I'm gonna mix for about 10 seconds. And I'll usually feel around the bottom of the bucket to see if I can feel any clumps. And if I don't feel clumps, then I'll give it one more stir. And we just want to make sure we're doing a good job of not splashing this glaze everywhere. And if you do, you have your sponge right next to you. Use it to clean up. Alright, so I need to use... A cup or some sort of um, pitcher or container that I can fill that container up and pour the glaze on the inside and then when I empty this out what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pour that glaze out so that it's coming out of the piece this way and I'm gonna turn the piece while I do it it's usually a one that takes a little bit of practice and you can actually practice with a, a red solo cup or other container before you do this on your actual piece because sometimes you might mess up and you don't coat the hole inside or you might have the piece drip down the side. Um, it's worth doing a couple practices first. So here I've got my red Solo cup that I'm going to use to get the glaze out of the bucket and into my piece. Um, if I hold the Solo cup from the sides, I'm going to get my hands full of glaze. So I want to make sure that I hold kind of the edge of the, the cup here and, and lift up the glaze just like that. Now I don't have to get my hands messy. Okay. As soon as I pour this glaze into the cup, I'm starting that two second timer. Uh, if you do leave the glaze on the inside for longer than two minutes though, it's okay. It's not going to hurt anything because your glaze won't drip out onto the shelf. Okay. So I'm going to pour it in there. And one one thousand, two one thousand. Now I'm going to spin my cup and turn it as I go. And pour that glaze out while I'm turning the cup so that it coats the entire inside. Now I'm going to shake out all the extra drips. And I've got the whole inside coated. So this will take just a couple minutes to dry. It's already pretty dry down on the inside. I've got a little bit tacky glaze up here on the top. So I need to let this sit aside and finish drying before I put my next coat on. When you're handling your work, once you've glazed it, the glaze that's up here at the top is usually fairly brittle, and if you grab this by the top, it'll flake off. So when you pick up a, a glazed piece, always pick it up from the outside. Don't grab the top edge so you don't crack that glaze off. Now I'm back over here to my red glaze, and I'm, I'm going to dip the outside of my cup in my red. So the white on the in inside is already done. I'm going to try not to get any glaze on the inside. I'm just going to dip the red on the outside. Since my red's been sitting here for a few minutes, some of that glaze material may have settled out toward the, toward the bottom of the bucket and that water's coming back up to the top. So we've got, got just little stir sticks back here that we use. Um, you want to mix your glaze back up before you dip. You should get in the habits of doing this pretty much all the, all the time because you don't know when the last person was there to use the glaze. You want to make sure that it's mixed up th thoroughly. Okay. Now for this one, I'm not going to use the tongs. I'm actually just going to put my hand on the inside of the piece and stretch my fingers out to hold on to the piece so it's not going to come off my hands. Okay. And I'm going to follow that same two-second dip rule, pull the piece out, and shake off all the extra water. Okay. When I'm done, I'll have a little bit of an edge I probably have to get up at the top. Okay. But I'm being careful not to allow the glaze to go over the top of the piece and down onto the inside. So again, I'm going to count that two-second timer. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. Pull it out. Shake off all the extra. And like I said before, you'll have a little bit of glaze on the bottom. You can just sponge that off really easily. Now this second coat is going to take a little bit longer to dry than the first one. Um, because when I did the first dip, there, there was already a little moisture put back into the piece. So um, another reason I like to do this with my hand on the inside is because now when I go to set my piece down, I don't have to touch the outside of the piece. I can set it down on a table, pull my hand out, and let it dry for a few minutes um, until I can handle it. Once it's ready to handle, again, you want to make sure there's no tacky spots and there's no spots that are going to come off when you touch them. A little bit of glaze left there. 
Now I can flip this upside down and I'm going to try to get this little edge that it missed when I did my dip. So I'm just going to touch the rim, 1-1-1000, one, 2-1000, one, one thousand, one let that shake off. <clears throat> Let's say I'm feeling a little bit adventurous and um, I've put my second, or I put my coat of glaze on the outside on my second dip. Um, but I want to maybe experiment with a little bit of overlapping of other glazes. So I've got that glossy red glaze on the outside. I've got the white liner glaze on the inside. Maybe I want to see what happens if I put another glaze over the surface. So I can do that. You can do a second dip of a different color. Um, you need to abide by the same two second rules. But you need to leave about an inch of space at the bottom to allow for your glaze to run because you have a double thickness so it's going to run a little bit more. So here I've got a blue glaze, so sort of borderlining, um, a little violet in there and over a dark, darker clay body it looks kind of the same, maybe a little tiny bit darker um, but for the most part it's pretty much the same. So I'm going to try this over my red and when I dip this one I'm actually going to dip it upside down so the rim goes in first, and if I keep keep my piece level as it goes down in the glaze, the air that's trapped in the bottom will prevent the glaze from going on the inside, and my white will stay white. If I put it in there a little bit crooked, um, it is going to get inside and coat my white. I could do a second coat on the inside if I wanted to, but I'm going to try to keep mine a nice white liner glaze. Okay. So as I've done before, I need to make sure that I'm mixing this up because, like I said, the glaze settles out and so there's water on the top. You want to make sure that it's nice and, and evenly mixed. So again, as I go in, I'm going to try to make sure that I, that I keep this straight up and down. I'm going to push in, 1-1000, one, 2-1-1000, one, one, let all that drip off of there. This is my third coat of glaze now, or my third application. So a lot of the water from the glaze has absorbed into the clay, and this last application is going to take the longest for it to dry. You can still see the sheen on, on there that this, this glaze is actually still a little bit wet. So when I'm done with this, I do not want to touch this if I don't have to. Um, you should never grab this to flip it over until it's totally dry. So I've got enough space down here that I can, can flip this over and I can hold on to the dry spot when I go, go set this down. Okay. And again, because I kept that air bubble on the inside and I kept this straight up and down, I don't have any issues with that glaze coating on the, on the inside of my piece. When you're done, you need to make sure that you, that you clean up after yourself. So this needs to get washed out in the sink. You need to make sure that you wash out your cup for your inside glaze if you use one. You need to make sure that you get your caps back on the glazes because if I, if I don't put the lid back on, this will slowly start evaporating water and then it gets too thick to, to dip. So I put the caps back on. All right, when you're done cleaning up, it should look like this back at the glaze station. All the lids are back on the buckets. All the tools are put away. Sponge is cleaned up and put back. Drills cleaned off and put back in the windowsill. There's no glaze on the tables. All right, so now that I've got my two finished glazed pieces, um, I'll, I'll usually have you guys load them right in the kilns. So once you've got your piece done, you can come up to me and check it off, and I'll let you know if you either need to adjust or clean up the glaze on the bottoms, or maybe you missed a spot. I will help you identify any issues before putting them right into the kiln. Um, if the kilns are full, I'll sometimes pull out a cart that will have, have you put these on, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and carry these in the back and we'll take a right, look so at here we are in the kiln room, ready to load our piece. We've checked it off with me so that I can give you the okay that, yep, that looks like you've got your glaze cleaned off, you've got it 
waxed back a little bit appropriately. There's no glazed chunks missing, things like that, okay? When you put it in the kiln, <clears throat> you're gonna make sure to not leave very much space in between the piece next to it, okay? With a glaze firing, we wanna get our pieces as close together as possible without touching them. If the pieces are touching, then sometimes that'll result in the two being fused together and then they're stuck together for good. And we don't want, we don't want to ruin somebody else's work. So I tell people just, you know, a credit card thickness in between them is plenty. And we want to try to get as many of those pieces on this shelf as we can. Okay. Another thing that you have to be paying attention to is the height of the kiln post. So this post here is what determines the height of the shelf. I have smaller ones and I have taller ones. Um, but you have to put work in that meets the shelf height. So for example, my my bowl here is plenty short to fit into there, okay? But my other piece that I glazed, if I'm not paying attention, is clearly too tall for this shelf. So if that's the case, then I'll have to set that on a cart until we get a taller shelf in, and then I can put that one in there. 